the diversity of reptiles observed in your local pet store, whether a mom and pop store or outlets of the mega corporations PetSmart and Petco, is quite low. That being said, one can find endless enjoyment in the hyperactive dog-like behavior of the bearded dragon, the sleepy nocturnal habits of the cat-like leopard gecko, or the high-strung ballet of the basilisk lizard. One species of lizard becoming more common in the pet trade, but seldom seen in the brick-and-mortar stores, is the Euromastix. This fat, tortoise-faced, spiny-tailed vegetarian is a large, handsome lizard with a lot of personality. 37 million years ago, a close cousin to the humble Euromastix may have been the largest herbivorous squamate to ever live. Myanmar is usually in the news for the treasure trove of amber fossils uncovered in the region, along with headlines of new, nearly mummified species found from Cretaceous-aged rocks, are the harrowing tales of the working conditions of wage slaves tasked with finding the precious fossilized resin. I took a much more in-depth look at the unethical conditions of Myanmar amber mines in my video on the bird-like lizard Oculodentavis. Click here to learn more. I really need to get on an update video for that. With the vast array of amber finds being published in scientific journals, it would be easy to assume amber fossils of the Cretaceous are everything Myanmar has to offer paleontologists. This is untrue. West Central Myanmar is home to a layer of rock which has been called the Pong Dong Formation. This layer, which dates to around 37 million years ago, is chock full of very fragmentary fossils of an assortment of Eocene fauna. Small bodied entelodonts, teeny hyenodont species, and primates are found in this rock. Herbivorous perisodactyls and artiodactyls make up much of the herbivore diversity. But in this area, at this time, there was another large bodied herbivore which put the rest to shame the Lizard King. The fragmented and unusual fossils of a giant lizard were recovered from an eroding outcrop of purple mudstone near a village in Myanmar's Segaing district. These fragments build a relatively complete lower jaw out of a handful of fragments. A piece of skull bone called the parietal was also found among the jaw pieces. They were given the name Barbatrix morrisoni. Barbatrix means Lizard King, and Morrisoni refers to Jim Morrison of the Doors, known by the nickname Lizard King. These bones are unusual for a few reasons. The lower jaw, when complete, has a series of gnarly rib-like protrusions on the bottom edge. Points like these are not known from many modern lizards, and may have been the attachment knobs for more elaborate soft tissue display structures, like skin flaps or keratin spines. Another weird thing, and perhaps more to the point of this video, and the importance of this find, is the sheer size of the bones. The lower jaw belonged to a skull which may have reached well over 4 or 5 inches, 10 to 12 centimeters. When a body length index equation was used to estimate a size for the specimens found, it was figured the critter may have reached a body length of around 3 feet, 1 meter, and a total length of around 6 feet, almost 2 meters. Though this doesn't make it the largest lizard, it does make it the largest herbivorous lizard to ever live. Barbatrix had two different styles of teeth. The teeth at the front of the jaw are called pleurodont, and the rest of the teeth are acrodont. Pleurodont means the tooth itself is fused to the side of the jaw and has no socket. Acrodont means the tooth is fused to the top of the jawbone, again without a socket. Acrodont teeth are one of the characteristic features of a group of lizards named after their teeth, the Acrodontoclade. The Acrodonts contain the chameleons and the agamids, or dragon lizards. Among the modern relatives to Barbatrix are the sailfin dragons, bearded dragons, butterfly dragons, and the mastigures. A phylogenetic analysis places Barbatrix as the closest relative of the modern Euromastix lizards of the Euromastisinae group colloquially termed the Mastigures. The characterization of Barbatrix as a giant iguana is largely inaccurate. It belongs to the extremely diverse clade Iguanomorpha. This group contains both the Acrodonta and the Pleurodonta. Just to show you how batshit it is to call Barbatrix an iguana, 
let's take a brief trip through the diversity of the Iguanomorpha. Iguanomorpha contains... <gasps> Agamids, chameleons, curly-tailed lizards, helmet lizards, collared, leopard, and tropidarine lizards, dwarf, spiny-tailed, marine, Fijian, Galapagos, rock, desert, and green iguanas, chuckwallas, anoles, horny toads, and South American swifts. <sighs> yeah, kinda bockers. With all this diversity and how unrelated Barbatrix is to true iguanas of today, it's a real big what the hell to me seeing a bunch of iguana-esque reconstructions. My freelance animators, Adam Midzuk and Tyler Addison, as well as one of my favorite paleo artists, Siri Thomas, have reconstructed Barbatrix more like the modern Neuromastix to which it is related. This is obviously very speculative, but it makes more sense in a family tree sort of way to reconstruct this big lizard more similar to its closest confirmed relatives than to a much more distant, yet still technically related group. Would it have had a big fat spiny tail sheathed in ring-shaped armor plates? Maybe. It's a common defense, display, and mechanical advantage for many unrelated lizards alive today. As an herbivore, it probably had a big fat gut to serve as a fermentation vat for all the foliage and fruit it may have consumed. If it had a tail like the Euromastix, its body length probably didn't reach 6 feet 2 meters. But if it was more like a thin whip, then a 6 foot length seems likely. Myanmar during the Eocene was warmer than it is today. Worldwide temperatures at the time were a good couple of degrees warmer, with very little to no ice at the poles. The researchers describing the remains of Barbatrix used the body mass index equation to estimate the heft of this six-foot lizard. They figured it may have weighed in as much as 40 to 80 pounds, 16 to 36 kilograms. This estimation puts the species of giant lizard smack dab in the middle of sizes among the fauna of this time and place. It was bigger and heavier than many of the mammalian carnivores and herbivores and was outshone only by members of the Perisodactyl order, which includes the rhinos. This is totally different from how it is today. In today's tropical latitudes, herbivorous lizards never grow to a size which rivals their mammalian contemporaries and tend to stay small, at 3 feet or less. Many of the tropical mammal species living with these modern plant-crunching lizards are bigger. What's up with this size discrepancy? The researchers think it has something to do with the temperatures and humidity present at this time in Earth's history, as well as the then higher latitudes of Myanmar. These high temperatures allowed the lizard to adapt such a large body size, in comparison to mammals in its ecosystem, because herbivorous reptiles need a lot of warmth to keep their bodies moving, and to digest the large amount of foliage they need to consume. Temperatures available to herbivorous reptiles today mean they just can't cut it at bigger sizes, while mammals in the same environment can reach Indian elephant size. This is a logical conclusion to come to with the given data, but there are a few alternatives which may have a hand to play. In the past, and in some manner to this day, many herpetologists, biologists, zoologists, and paleontologists were under the assumption mammals are better than reptiles when it comes to metabolism. Yes, a warm-blooded metabolism is faster and does provide many benefits, which aren't present in a cold-blooded existence. But this is far too simple. There are now countless examples of animals, alive or extinct, which mix up the metabolic ball game to benefit a population to a given environmental stress. To simply say mammals can get bigger than reptiles in the same environment because of their higher metabolism disregards the exceptions which disprove this rule, like with Barbatrix. Many other faunas during this period in the Cenozoic, before times of global cooling, included reptiles of unusual size. Titanoboa, Stupendemes, Purasaurus, and more patrolled the tropics of South America, and large snakes, giant monitor lizards, and land crocs rounded out the giant reptile market in Australia. There was something else going on. Instead of just a matter of high temperatures, the reason Barbatrix got big might also have something to do with it being an opportunistic herbivore. Or maybe its ancestors were large to begin with, when temperatures were even warmer, and mammals were even smaller. Until more fossils are found of this awesome lizard, exactly why it got so big remains just a little bit of a mystery. 
subscribe to consume some delicious contento, trash the like button, scrape out a comment, and blast the notification bell just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. A very special thanks to my patrons, Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Ed Peretz, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, Dana Manchester, Clayton Maxfield, and Tron. If you'd like to support my channel and receive some extra content, pledge to my Patreon at any tier you want.